giving you a voice. Making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, FRC is produced in partnership with the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archive first robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And by viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun at loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Welcome to Best of the West, where just because the season is suspended doesn't mean our producer, Tyro, lets us have a break. For your viewing pleasure, we are shifting focus from event recaps to spotlighting awesome teams who represent the Best of the West region, where you'll get a better look at their team and robot. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Aiden Ferrer. And I'm Alex Utzinger. Let's welcome on our guests for this evening. This team went 14-2 and in Infinite Recharge and were the winners of the Utah Regional. They also won the Quality Award for their awesome machine. It's Team 8, Pally Robotics. Join us from Team 8 to talk to a... Uh, joining us from Team 8 to talk more about their season is Griffin. Griffin, welcome to the show. Why don't you tell us a little more about yourself before we get started? Sure. Uh, so I'm a junior on Team 8, Pally Robotics. This is my third year on the team, and I am this season's design sub-team captain. So I was basically responsible for um, leading the rest of the design sub-team and the robot and uh, making sure that everything from prototyping to the CAD stages to the handoff to build was running smoothly. So would you say you've been one of the big shot callers for Team 8 uh, robot-wise this year? Uh, one of them, but you know, it's always a team effort, so yeah. Yeah, always. Well, always. so as, as uh, someone who was helping lead this uh, whole project, what was the game plan for you? y'all on kickoff and what was your initial strategy conceptual robot design or anything that you knew that you wanted to do from day one so um starting on kickoff uh, after you know reading the game manual and making sure everybody understood the game the first thing we wanted to do was sort of set our goal for the season so in the past a lot of what we've done is i'm um, sort of thinking about what the powerhouse teams are going to be doing and then sort of what team compositions are going to be so robot trying to be but uh oh, sorry but uh what we wanted to do this year was um sort of secure our blue banner and we thought the best way to do that would be to sort of maximize our ranking score get high up enough that we can either be in control of who we're picking during alliance selections or we want to be the most appealing first pick at the competition so for us that meant sort of thinking about uh the different ways of getting ranking points uh, obviously uh, we want to win to get those two ranking points every match. So um, just based on the different scoring opportunities, we wanted to go for the high scoring positions, outer goal and the inner goal uh, for the bonus points. And so that led to us thinking about the shooter design and different scoring paths. And then between the other two ranking points, we thought that having a really consistent climb would get us the ranking point more often than trying to complete all three stages. So based on that, we came up with our priority list with our um, sort of uh, mechanisms or different goals in the game that we needed to have. So those would be things like um, obviously intaking, uh, really capable drivetrain, getting us over the rendezvous zone and um, scoring high. And then things that would, um, would be nice to have. So our sort of wants list, that would be stuff like um, scoring from all different areas on the field so both in like in the trench zone on the other side of the control panel spinner would be really ideal and then things that would be nice to have if possible so something like that to sort of uh, make our climbing ranking point a little more consistent would be having some sort of active rebalancing system to let us move on the bar and get those 15 balance points every time so, so based on yeah I'm sorry. Uh, so that being said, um, that seems like a great uh, a great list. But what were some of the challenges that you faced during the build season and uh, getting that in getting that list into 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 a robot? Sure. So um, 
one of the bigger challenges at the start was sort of prioritizing um, what parts of the robot we like wanted to have as functional as possible, and then also sort of trying to predict how a match would play out. So in our initial stages of design, we thought that being able to sort of collect balls from the loading station would be really valuable in shortening our cycle times. And that added a few packaging constraints to the robot that we had to deal with. So uh, one example is that our intake, um, we had to make sure that when it was folded up inside the robot, it didn't take up a whole lot of horizontal space so that we would have enough room for the balls to go over it and into our sort of hopper. And um, that meant that uh, we had to have it sort of pivot as it came out of the robot. And that led to a whole bunch of different iterations. So uh, the one that we ended up with at the end was uh, the one that you would see on our bot at Utah, this uh, uh, virtual four bar, where basically uh, it was piston driven to pivot out. And with the different sized sprockets and chain attached to the intake, it would uh, change position as it went out. And then some other things that we had challenges with were weight. So always uh, on teammate, um, we tend to sort of like maximize our space in the robot and use like every pound that we can get. So what ended up happening was our practice pot was actually 10 pounds overweight when we first weighed it a few weeks before competition. Really? Yeah. So um, after that, moving to the competition bot, we looked for every way that we could possibly shed material. So we originally had our actively rebalancing hook on the practice bot. We got rid of that to save weight for a new passive hook. And uh, we also did a lot of windowing and uh, pocketing on a robot. And we somehow managed to drop enough pounds to be legal for competition. What That's was always the, uh, good stuff. What was the final weight of the robot do you know? I think at Utah weigh-in, it was, it was 124 point something. Oh, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> So you had mentioned earlier in your design process with your list of wants and needs, um, you'd mentioned that you're trying to think about what the powerhouses were doing, what other top teams were making. Uh, did you take any inspiration from any previous robots that were either your own or another powerhouse team uh, in, in California? And how did that shape this year's bot? Absolutely. We, uh, we love the 1678 motto of stealing from the best and inventing the rest. So uh, one of the biggest lessons that we've learned uh, with our intake was um, sort of in 2016, intake completely inside the frame perimeter, and it did not work out very well. So since then, we've um, realized that the full width intakes are much more efficient. Uh, this one actually let us, uh, in an ideal scenario, pick up three uh, power cells side by side, so bring them into the robot. So definitely that we uh, borrowed a lot of the mechanical design of the rollers on a robot with the surgical tubing over aluminum round stock from some powerhouse teams. Uh, what else? We looked at a lot of robots from 2012 for the indexer and the shooter, since uh, we found that game was pretty similar to this one in terms of shooting a bunch of um, like medium-sized balls compared to, say, Steamworks, where the balls were a lot smaller. It was a lot more volume or Stronghold where it was just one at a time. But uh, we definitely looked at teams from those years as well, our hood especially. With um, We didn't want to go for a completely sort of um, adjustable hood with a like a gear on the back to because uh, we thought that would be added complexity and it would take up another motor slot. So we came up with this uh, three position piston driven hood design by looking at teams 2056 and 1114 from 2016. And you had also mentioned that you had to shave pounds off your robot before getting to your events because you were uh, several pounds overweight. What other preparations for uh, the actual competition did you have to make, whether it was weight savings or other cuts to the design? Um, those weight savings and design cuts were actually pretty similar to each other. Um, so dropping the active hook saved us a few pounds. Um, we actually allocated space on a robot for a turret, just in case. We never planned to put that on in time for Utah, but we were thinking maybe before Monterey or before Champs, we would put that in there. But uh, we definitely did not have the weight to do that. 
So um, taking out some of the material that we had put in there to sort of mount the turret gearbox to, that saved us uh, at least a pound, I'm pretty sure. And then uh, in preparation for Utah, was there anything specific that you guys did uh, for driver training that you think uh, really contributed to your success? Uh, well, just in general, we had sort of a lot of driver training before Utah. We are really lucky to have the space for a full practice field in our lab. So starting at the very beginning of the season, um, all, the, all the freshmen and some of the veteran members helped lead the building of our uh, wooden practice field. And that means that software can get testing autos with our past robots really early in the season. So that's helpful. Uh, it helped us get two uh, very high scoring autos this year, uh, which we're pretty proud of. So we saw both of those being used at Utah. And then also, uh, since we save our past robots, we got a lot of uh, drive practice against defense this year. So that was really helpful, we think. Well, so we want to focus a little bit more on uh, the auto. Yeah, can you explain a bit more about how that was developed, what you were looking for with that? What, what kind of things did you come up with? Sure. So the two auto routines that we had, uh, one of them was uh, starting in the center shooting our first three power cells and then moving to our own trench. And the goal of that one was to just take a pretty um, sort of linear path and then shoot from a protected shoot, um, just the balls that were on our side of the field. And then the other one would bring us over to our opponent's trench. Uh, so we would take those two balls and then move over back towards the center to shoot. And basically between these two autos, we could uh, run our robot on one side of the field and that way we could avoid conflict with our alliance partners. Well, definitely sounds like you made a really robust, well-designed bot, and you've got the awards to show for it. Uh, let's focus a little bit more on how you won those awards. Let's talk about Utah a bit. Um, going into the event outside of California, you know, your region that you usually play in, uh, was there anyone that was already on your radar going into Utah as teams that you knew, oh, we want to play with them or we need to look out for them? Yeah, so um, pretty prominent Team 21-22 Taters, obviously a world-class level team playing on... Einstein's pretty consistently. Uh, we were definitely looking out for them. Actually, the first day when the match schedule came out, we saw that we had two back-to-back -back matches, one with them and one against them. So we started thinking about our strategy for playing against them and how that match would play out. Uh, some other teams, 1339 Angel Botics, we actually got a lot of footage of their robot from before the event over Discord. And their robot was definitely looking really strong uh, you, you could see at the event that they could shoot uh, their power cells really quickly. So we were definitely thinking about partnering with them or looking out for them as a threat. And then 1410 Kraken, historically a pretty strong team, and they demonstrated that very well at this event. And then a couple more, uh, 3230 and 4068, just some historically pretty strong teams from that area. Okay, and then so uh, with all this pre-scouting, um, you must have had a pretty easy time of alliance selections. What was your strategy going into uh, picking an alliance? So uh, the night before alliance selections, we were basically going through the different scenarios. Um, the easiest one is the one that fortunately ended up playing out. We were picked by Kraken. We were hoping to either get picked by them or 1339. And then in that case, we would just focus on our second pick. But then the um, scenario that we did a lot of preparation for was what would happen if they, um, say, if 1410 ended up picking 1339, which we thought was pretty likely going into the second day of quals matches. And in that case, we were just looking for who our strongest partner would be going up against them. So we were definitely looking at uh, Team Taters, 2122. Uh, we were also looking at 4068 high up on our pick list. Basically, someone who could complement our scoring and our autos, and someone with a consistent climb. And then for our second pick, uh, we're really happy with what ended up happening. We caught um, some match footage of 3245 playing incredible defense, and also their um, robot was really effective at shuttling balls across the field. We thought that would be really handy for shortening cycle times, since we wouldn't have to cross the field if they were shooting balls through the trench. And then in our last match, uh, Qual's 90, 
we actually played against them and they played some really hard defense against us. So that solidified our opinion of them as a really strong defensive robot. I, I'm going to press you guys here and, and ask you, if you were not selected by 1410, you guys end up being an Alliance captain. Looking at how the alliances kind of worked out, who would have been your first pick? Um, probably Team Taters. They had a really strong showing in Teleop, and we think that would have been very valuable, as well as a strong auto. And then uh, we probably would have gone with a... Um, a consistent climber for our third bot just to secure the balance points at the end. But we definitely had a number of teams on our pick list who we were looking out for. Yeah. So it sounds like you got your kind of dream scenario here, pairing up with 1410, the Kraken and uh, 3245 Ravens. Uh, these two teams, I don't think you've ever gotten to play with them before. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Awesome. Well, what was it like? What was it? Uh, what was your experience playing outside your region in Elims with uh, an alliance that you've never really had to work around? It's not familiar faces. What was your experience uh, working with these two teams? Uh, overall, it was a very positive experience. Uh, we actually had gone to a few competitions out of state in the past, um, so that's not something we're completely unused to. But Kraken, uh, we definitely um, like we we're talking with them a lot before Alliance selections. Uh, they helped us out a lot actually with our limelight uh, since uh, we were having a couple issues disconnecting the limelight during qualification matches, but then they gave us some tips before ELIMS and throughout ELIMS those were totally fine. Uh, generally no issues working with those two teams and it was, uh, it was a pleasure to get to play with them. Sounds great. So you guys seem to have established a pretty good relationship in qualification. So then uh, during eliminations, what were some of the strategies that you used that ultimately won the day and allowed you guys to take home the victory? So definitely uh, 3245's defense played a huge role in our success, I think. They were able to sort of shut down entire areas of the field, uh, stop, uh, completely stop like Angel Botics from scoring and Taters. So definitely that matchup against the third seed alliance, we were worried about the others, um, the other alliances scoring capabilities since during the rest of the ELA matches, they were putting up similar numbers to us during auto and teleop. But I think um, that played a big role. Um, the combined auto with us and Kraken, both of us um, being able to take on the two different sides of the field, we were able to put up a lot of points during auto. And then also 1410's adjustable climb combined with our really consistent climber, uh, that definitely got us a lot of points at the end of the match. Well, it's awesome to see that that uh, played out perfectly for y'all. You obviously got your blue banner out of Utah, and congrats on that again. Um, so the season is postponed, but you do technically have Monterey Bay as your next regional, uh, as, even though it's suspended. So should you get to play at Monterey, uh, and you've got that chance qualification on the horizon, what are the things that you think a uh, teammate wants to accomplish going further into the supposed infinite recharge season? Should you get to play? I know you'd mentioned having room for a turret. Is that something you think you need after Utah? What are some of the adjustments that you'd like to make? Yeah. So we had a number of iterations lined up, uh, even before Utah, we were thinking about making these. Um, so first, even though we're very happy with our intake, we were seeing that um, it got damaged a little bit in some of the quals matches, and it was pretty heavy. So we wanted to sort of change that out instead of the virtual four bar for a normal four bar intake. That way we would also save some weight. Uh, something else, our the V-belt section of our indexer, so the slanted polycarb plate combined with the diagonal rollers with belts, we were thinking of making that angle a little more aggressive because um, throughout the competition, um, there were some issues with our indexer jamming a little bit, especially during auto. So the biggest change that we were going to make was actually swapping out the poly cord for uh, traditional timing belts because um, I had actually talked with the CAD lead from 1339 shortly after Utah, and he told me a lot about their indexer and I, that was really valuable for me to hear because their robot was obviously able to shoot the balls 
very quickly. And that would be the primary goal for us going into Monterey and Champs. And then did you guys have any advice for teams who maybe haven't had the chance to play yet and might be going to competitions? Uh, so going into the off season, I would say definitely um, attending competitions is like the best way to learn and practice. Um, I think it's unfortunate that we didn't get to see the really high levels of play this season, but there are still a lot of great match videos out there. And uh, you can learn a lot of the strategy from watching other teams and seeing what they're iterating on. So I think just keeping up with the philosophy of trying to keep up with the teams that are really far ahead will get you pretty far. Well, that kind of segues into one of our audience questions that we have here. Someone in the chat was asking, how did your team, Team 8, become so god-tier? Um, do you want to expand on that, Griffin? Well, uh, first, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. I think we've been working towards this for a number of years, and this was just the one where all of our effort in the past has kind of, like, kind of come to fruition. So we've definitely just been learning a lot from our mistakes before. And I think what happened this year was everything just ended up working out well for us. Uh, the, the removal of the bag day helped us a lot because it allowed us to iterate on a lot of different mechanisms between when stop build would have been and when Utah started. We actually completely changed our indexer between when we first handed off the practice bot to software to when we shipped the robot off to Utah. And we were able to do that because uh, we saw all the teams that were playing in the early weeks and we had the time uh, between then and Utah to hand it off. Uh, we also got a couple uh, new sort of manufacturing capabilities this season that allowed us to iterate really quickly. One of those being a, um, a CNC router, and that allowed us to uh, sort of completely design, machine, and test our new indexer in a span of just a few days. So that was really helpful to our performance this season. So it looks like we also got another question from a uh, Twitch user, Recycle Rush, which uh, summarizes how I feel about that <laughs> game pretty good. Uh, definitely one of the more frustrating events I've ever, or games I've ever heard to play. They ask, how did you specifically decide to go with a tall bot over a low bot? Yeah, so uh, we were thinking about the low bot as an option at the start, but um, that would just add a whole lot of sort of packaging constraints and difficulties. And we knew that if we made a robot that was just capable of going over the rendezvous zone consistently, then we wouldn't really have to worry about anything. Uh, we also uh, took a little bit of advice from Karthik talking about 2016, how he was just shocked at how many teams opted to go underneath the low bar, since it's, it just makes the rest of the design of the robot so much more difficult. So to make it easier for us designing our indexer path as the game piece went through the robot, and to also give a space for a potential hopper to intake from the loading station, we felt that a tall bot would sort of make it easier for the rest of the design of our robot. And I want to shift the focus just a little bit as we get to the end of our show tonight. Um, I know you'd mentioned that your robot wasn't necessarily God tier, but I think a lot of us in the Bay Area certainly think that your awards game is. Uh, you guys have been winning numerous Entra awards, uh, probably one of the most dominant teams in California with the Entrepreneurship Award. Uh, and you took away a quality award from Utah. What's Pally's secret? How have you guys been uh, doing so well on the awards front? Uh, well, I can definitely talk about the quality award uh, from this year. So that one, um, I would say that just comes from our designers kind of having the sort of drive to keep iterating on their ideas throughout the whole season. That intake definitely did not start out the way it ended up, and it took a lot of work to get it working the way it did. We were actually working on making it a little more robust all the way up until the week before Utah. There were some issues with parts of it breaking, but we uh, just kept working through it and got a solution in time, and it held up for the rest of the competition. And then for Entree, I'm not a part of the awards team that works on this, but I know that our uh, business team just puts in a lot of time into this one specific award, and they have a lot of practice with it, obviously. So I think they know what they're doing, and 
they just uh, take what they learn from each year and they keep applying it. And uh, do you have any final thoughts on either reflecting on your season or Utah or winning the quality award that you want to share with the audience tonight before we uh, head on out for tonight? Uh, just that I'm, I know personally myself and the rest of the team, we're all very happy with how this season went. Obviously a little bit disappointed about uh, the season getting cut short, but we have no complaints. Well, and uh, unfortunately, that's all we have time for tonight. Thanks for everyone for hanging out with us. Fun needs your help to stay loud, live, and independent. Please consider giving your support support by joining Fun Nation with a subscription or bits on Twitch, becoming a patron at patreon.com slash first updates now, or just letting people in first know that this is the place to be to get the information that your team needs. Don't forget to check us out on Discord, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and live on Twitch. On behalf of myself, Aiden, and our producer, Tyler, I would like to thank you for tuning in and thank our moderators in chat. Best of, Best of the West will be back in two weeks, but fun will have shows every Monday and Tuesday. So make sure that you check social and Discord to stay informed. Talk to you next time on Best of the West. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and tier two plus subscribers on Twitch keeping fun loud, live, and independent.